Club meeting came around, and four of the players, whose characters I completely forgot, were very distracted during the game and have no idea what was going on, and also did not want to even be there. After two sessions, they completely stopped showing up and just left, and so did I. But they aren't the problem players. The boy next to me, the bard, he was. During the first session, we wake up in a dungeon. As I tried to lead the party since I was the only player that was actually interested in the campaign, the bard kept talking and talking and talking about the most random, ridiculous things that derailed the entire session. He kept making weird, insinuating noises and jokes and about how charming his character was. He was the very typical neckbeard weeb incel in the making. After talking for 30 minutes and constantly interrupting the dungeon master to make unnecessary comments and jokes, we reach a room separate from the long tunnel. I go in first and was followed by another player, when I was suddenly attacked by an armored skeleton-like figure. We go into combat and find out it was a mimic. A mimic with tentacles. I was struck once and I was left with one hit point. We were all level one. Me and the rest of the party all attack the mimic and it was the bard's turn. On his turn, he did nothing. He told the dungeon master he didn't want to attack, dodge, support, nothing. On the Mimic's turn, it restrains the bard with its tentacles, and he starts saying some even wilder comments. He asked the Dungeon Master about the tentacle texture, if it was slimy, and if it had suction cups on the tentacles. I was disgusted, disappointed, and livid. My first ever session was my first ever character. I loved her, and it was my first ever OC. I spent a week drawing and designing her just to have her first campaign be ruined by some immature boy that just wanted to play out his gross fantasy thinking it was funny. We defeated the Mimic, but I left the session heartbroken. Next session was the same. No one was paying attention to the DM, and the I wasted hours talking over the dungeon master. At the third session, no one showed up. I was the only player from the group who did. I walked out and never went back to the club again. I don't get romance in any way, but come on. A mimic? Really? So this is a bit of a different RPG horror story that isn't about bad behavior from a single player or DM. Apologies if this doesn't really constitute as a horror story, I'll remove it if I have to. At the very least, I'm very shook by this experience. So about four months ago, I have been DMing in person in a physical game store. It's a paid position and we run two tables of eight people each Thursday night. Our Dungeons and Dragons nights were fantastic, easily filling every single seat to the point where I have to keep reminding people to pre-register weeks ahead of time. We have a lot of great folks that show up, from parents bringing their children to some other socially awkward people that were getting better with their social skills by interacting in a role-playing game setting. There were definitely some hiccups. The DM before me was just a straight up creep. I made an entire horror story post about him. You can see that in my profile about the guy who did yeah, that's, that's something for another day. Anyway, enough said. He got fired. We've also had some obnoxious children that I've had to be the surrogate father to because for some reason no parent was ever with them. Other than that, though, things were fantastic. Our group of DMs were in line with helping each other out and covering when we need to. Our regular players listen to us and understand certain rules and restrictions we put in place while also allowing them to do mostly what they wanted. We had people show up every single Thursday night like it was church for them. This will be relevant later, but it should be noted that everyone who shows up has to pay a $5 fee for their seat. And also every person who shows up is going to end up buying food, drinks, and perhaps some merchandise, so it was very profitable for the store. So tell me, please explain to me. Why, when last night we are in the middle of another great session, and we look at our phones and see that in our private Facebook group, the game coordinator dude posted that they're shutting down Dungeons and Dragons nights permanently, immediately, with no explanation for why. Just like that. He couldn't even come to the store and tell us to our faces. He asked us to let the players know that this awesome community that we fostered is now getting shut down, essentially. Luckily, since I'm a manager in my big boy job, I was more than used to having these kind of hard talks in a group setting. I didn't mean it was easy, though. I like to reiterate that this happened in the middle of a session. No clues or hints this was coming, just dumping it on a Facebook post and allowing us to deal with the fallout. One of the DMs is an actual employee of the store, and apparently he said it may or may not have been because of the three little boys I mentioned earlier who were obnoxious because people complained about them. I can't confirm that, but if that's the case, that's insane to me. Just ban the kids if they're ruining everyone's time. It's okay. 
You did what you had to do. You was a traitor. We can't have people who sell us out to the enemy on our side. Yeah, you're right. What? All right. Any last words? Why? If there's one traitor among us, I have to kill everybody. It's the only way. I'm at peace with my gods. You do what you have to. Wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. What do you mean? One guy screwed us over, so therefore I have to destroy the whole thing. Makes sense to me. I mean, why would you kill everybody? That one guy is who betrayed us. The rest of us are cool. You're just gonna leave yourself all alone? Uh, you're just trying to trick me. Shut up. What, making too much sense for you? So, we got D&D back up for all of two weeks. I ran a Harry Potter themed session this past Sunday that was meant for two tables of eight people. And four people showed up. The module, as written, was supposed to be done in six hours with eight people, and we got done in like 4.5 with the four instead. Needless to say, the module was already edited heavily on the fly to draw it out as much as possible without making it a drag. Well, one of the game coordinators starts spamming me via Facebook Messenger Tuesday morning with a line of questions. How many people showed up? When did you guys end? When did you guys leave? Before I continue, I should note again, I am not like an employee of the store. I am told to show up, pick up my check, and run a Dungeon & Dragon session and have it end before the set end time. I answer all the questions honestly, as I have nothing to hide, nor did it seem like there was any issue. All four of my players were Potterheads and loved the session, but apparently I need to get yelled at because... You did not communicate how many people showed up. I have never had to do this in the four months I've been there. You shouldn't have ended early. People paid for a six hour session. People paid the same amount of money. $5 for our regular four hour one shot. This module was four and a half hours and $5. And on top of that, we only had four out of 16 people that we designed the module around. You did not tell me that you left. Again, I have never had to do this before and I don't work for the store. Want me to act like an employee? Give me a salary and hire me for money. This guy was just so disrespectful to me saying, oh well, I would have done this. I've done that before, and demeaning me in other ways. I basically just told him, okay to everything after that, and told the other dungeon masters at the store, I'm done. I will not be disrespected and harassed by a dude who doesn't communicate his expectations. He treats me like an inferior when I don't even work for him. Bro, I'm a regional manager of my actual job. I don't need this crap in my life. Sad to say, I left the store behind, but a one and a half drive every Thursday to the dang place, that will not be missed. Oh, and apparently, in the same day I quit, they canceled yet another Dungeons & Dragons project we set up. A campaign we set up for the players, which is just... wonderful. Man, a horror story of a completely different caliber, and I'm sure a type of horror story we are all going to experience at some point in our lives. It doesn't matter if they're running a small business or a massive corporation. Some people just want to act like wannabe despots, and it annoys the crap out of me. I often view lack of communication, especially in a Dungeons & Dragons game setting, as a mistake not done with malicious intent. But even if it is a mistake here as well, if you are running a business, lack of communication with the people who operate in your store, whether whether they be employees or they're just doing this as a gig, that is not acceptable. This person just sounds extremely annoying to work with. And when you're extremely annoying to work with, it shouldn't be surprising when people don't want to work for you. Especially if it's a D&D game running gig that they're doing mostly for fun. Especially, especially, by the way, I almost forgot, when you randomly decide to shut down that fun without giving any sort of reason. That's just not oh, cool, man. I'm at the end of my rope at this point. I have no idea how I'm supposed to keep up with my players and their adventure. I feel like I've pitted them against the same generic band encounters with boring loot for the 15th time in a row now, and I think it is starting to get to them. I need to deal with this. Thank God I found Tome of Summoning! This video is sponsored by Tome of Summoning and their brand new Kickstarter double feature with Deck of Loot and the Deck of Encounters, enhancing your Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition games with both delightful and deadly trinkets and creatures and monsters for your party to encounter on the road.
I don't know about you guys, but I absolutely despise when I finish an epic encounter and I'm rewarded with a couple silver coins and some scraps of cloth. Yeah, not anymore. Each deck of loot card is bursting with flavorful items that are sure to spark curiosity and intrigue with every roll. Hey, by the way, not all that curiosity and intrigue is good. Depending on what you roll, you might get an epic item or a whole new problem to deal with. Speaking of problems and encounters, the deck of encounters doesn't just give you combat scenarios, it gives you interesting traps, environmental hazards, and even an ally or two set for your party level as well. Guys, Tome of Summoning has already sextupled their goal on Kickstarter, so to say the least, people kind of like this stuff, and I think you guys would like it too. In short, are you in need of awesome encounters and loot? Well then, head down into the description to check out the Tome of Summoning Kickstarter for yourself. It's also linked in the pinned comment down below. Thank you so much to Tome of Summoning for sponsoring today's video. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. When I was recruiting for my current campaign last year, I had someone who seemed like a great fit until they presented their character concept to me. The premise was that it would be a horror campaign set in the world of Eberron, which revolved around the player's backstories. Each player was to either have a backstory which included a traditional horror monster, zombies, vampires, Frankenstein's monster, etc., or have a hole in which I could add one. Over the course of the campaign, we'd explore each of these backstories, and we'd get a fun Eberron twist on these horror monsters. The campaign would start with their first day at an entry-level position in one of the dragon-marked houses, essentially mega corporations who have arguably more power than countries. The players would choose together which house they would pick. The problematic player's backstory was that they had been a high-ranking member of one of the dragon-marked houses, discovered the house was committing war crimes and tried to get it to stop but was unable to, the house tried to assassinate him and all of his family for acting against them, his family were slaughtered but he escaped, he went into hiding and contacted a newspaper and wrote a scathing article about the house, its war crimes, and its attack on his family. The article went quote-unquote viral and everyone was appalled, completely disowning the house, causing its complete collapse. This caused serious ripples in the workings of the world, weakening all of the other dragon-marked houses, causing them to have considerably less influence, and most people to be wary of them. The other dragon-marked houses sent assassins after him, causing him to need to flee his home once again. He ended up in a different country, from which he began to work with law enforcement to root out corruption. He ultimately became a household name for driving out corruption and was hired by heads of state and other large organizations to fix their corruption uh, problems. Rather than him applying to an entry-level position at the Dragon Marked House, he instead wanted it such that the Dragon Marked House had reached out to him and hired him to solve their corruption uh, problem. Eberron generally allows for level 1 player characters to have a lot more experience than other settings, I generally presume. A common backstory is having served in the Hundred Year War, for example, but I thought this was kinda wild. It read like a synopsis of a character arc over the course of a campaign, rather than a backstory. I tried to explain that this was a bit much for a level 1 player character, even in Eberron, that the backstory didn't really fit the theme of the campaign as it lacked any sort of horror element, and that I was uncomfortable with his backstory completely altering the relationship of the houses with the world. It's a big change to one of the main elements of the setting, especially as it's one that the campaign was intended to revolve around. Also, that single newspaper article would not cause the collapse of this mega corporation. Real life mega corporations receive bad press all the time, and it doesn't even dent them. Just look at what Nestle posts with profit records. That it seems improbable for dragon marked houses to hire him if he was famously responsible for destroying one of their number and severely hurting all the others. That such a backstory put him in a position of power over the other players, which was unfair to them. That his backstory essentially sounded complete. There wasn't much left for there to be done and explored throughout the actual campaign. I offered to compromise, essentially allowing the first three points, which still left him as a previously powerful and influential member of a dragon-marked house, which I still thought was a bit of an overreach, but I figured it was at least workable, and that we could explore the rest of what he wanted over the course of the campaign if he could add the horror element to it. 
but he would not budge. And as soon as I mentioned compromise, he told me he was quote unquote disappointed in me and that he had worked really hard on this concept at the pub the night before? What's up with the question marks? That totally checks out. He then left the campaign discord without saying much of anything to the other players. Ultimately, it's obvious now that we dodged a bullet, but the replacement player we got for him is awesome. The group is nearly 40 sessions in the campaign and having heaps of fun. Yeah, probably for the best. I love it when problem players reveal the problems early so you can get rid of them. And yeah, backstories can be a difficult line to walk. You want to do all the cool stuff, but you need to remember the coolest stuff happens during the game, not during the backstory. Obviously, it depends on what kind of game you're joining, what level you're starting at, but obviously for level one, this is too much. It personally really bothers me when players try to completely change up the DM's world without consulting them first. It's collaborative, obviously, but if you just change up massive parts of the world with a couple lines of text in the backstory, I'm sorry, I'm always gonna think that's kinda lame. For ease of reference, the cast is as follows. Me, your dear writer and forever DM, TTRPG fanatic who has been running various systems for 10 plus years, including Dungeons & Dragons, Call of Cthulhu, World of Darkness, and Shadowrun. Bard, a close family friend of mine, we've known each other for over 10 years, and we're still in regular contact after this story. Cleric, a mutual friend of mine and Bard's who soon became a close friend of mine due to the enthusiasm he displays in Dungeons & Dragons. Paladin, another one of Bard's friends, best friend of three years to Cleric, and before long, a good friend of mine. Rogue is Paladin's girlfriend, who joins the game later. Ranger, a friend from Cleric's work, who joins the game at the same time as Rogue. Our story begins in late 2019. I, a veteran and forever dungeon master of multiple game systems, am approached by my longtime friend Bard asking if I'd like to run a D&D 5th edition game for him and a few of our mutual friends, who have always been interested in D&D, but have never had the chance to play. It's been a while since I've had a regular group, so I jump at the chance, and being able to introduce some of my closest friends to a hobby that's very important to me sounds like an excellent time. Bard hosts our first few games at his house, and I meet and quickly become friends with Cleric and Paladin, as they take to the game like naturals, and we spend many hours outside of the game bonding over video games, music, and nerd stuff. The group also includes my best friend of 20 years, playing a gnome wizard, and another one of Bard's friends playing a drow fighter, though those two are not relevant to the events to come and are only mentioned for the sake of establishing our original group of four. As most of the players are new to D&D and I am new to 5th edition, having only ran 3.5 edition in the past, I ran the group through Lost Minds of Fandelver and we had a fantastic time overall. Then 2020 rolls around and with it comes the pandemic. Lockdowns begin and we can no longer meet at Bard's house to play in person. This doesn't end up being a problem as I quickly work out how virtual tabletops work and set up a discord so we can play online. Freed from the restriction of having to drive all over the state to meet up physically, we even end up playing every week as opposed to only having a session every fortnight. Everyone is having a great time and playing TTRPGs is keeping us all sane during the pandemic. After a while, Bard, Cleric, and Paladin even become interested in games other than D&D, so I end up running other games on alternating weeks, such as Call of Cthulhu and even a bit of Vampire the Masquerade. Everything seems to be going well, and being friends in real life, our group gels fantastically and has a bare minimum of drama. It's after a few months of playing online that two things happen that will spell the eventual doom of the group and the destruction of years-long friendships. The first is that Cleric begins to talk to a co-worker about our adventures and, excited to try TTRPGs, that co-worker asks if he can join us sometime in the future. The second is that Paladin's girlfriend, who has spent the last few months listening to our sexy voices, which is her words, wants to finally join our game. I've been enjoying my time with the group, and in my mind, more people could only mean more fun times, so I welcome both of these newcomers. And Ranger and Rogue soon become valued members of the group. Sadly, it's here where things start to go wrong, but definitely not in a way I ever expected. The first red flag shows itself when Rogue asks me for build advice for her character. Being new to the game and wanting to be a helpful DM, I oblige her and we start talking on Facebook. After a while, the conversation subject changes from D&D to other nerd stuff and soon just life in general. I start to value Rogue as a friend and every now and then, we spend hours talking to each other about our lives and our problems and just generally being there for each other. Look, several times Rogue mentions that it was our sexy voices that got her interested in joining our game and she says a number of things to me that 
that are just borderline creepy, such as asking what I, as a married man, think about polyamorism, or showing me pictures of when she was a model and asking if I found them, like, attractive. At this point, I feel it's important to specify that I'm actually asexual, and so the innuendo is lost on me, and I don't really think anything of it until my wife points it out to me. The amount of empathy for this asexual confusion is real. Okay, wait, so just let me get this straight. They talk to you every night for hours on it. I mean, yeah, by that point, we're both off of work. I mean, the things we talk about, they're not like that crazy. I was a little uncomfortable, but it's all good. They called your voice sexy. I mean, my voice is a big insecurity of mine, so it, it was very nice of them to, to say that, you know? They compliment your physique every time they see you. Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to work out, and it, it, was, it was cool for someone to, you know, notice the change. And you just don't think anything of this? Why would I? They're, they're just being friendly. We've talked like that all the time. I realize that Rogue is flirting with me, and not wanting to, like, lead her on, I tell her that I'm happily married, and I don't want to come between her and Paladin, and thankfully our conversation returns to normal afterwards. I still value her as a friend, and thinking I've nipped a problem in the bud, I put these anomalies out of my mind, and life continues on. The second red flag appears a few months later, when I notice Ranger and Rogue flirting with each other in-game. This upsets Paladin a little, as being new to the hobby, he still sometimes has problems separating in-character interactions from out-character interactions. I immediately lay down some rules for the group, stating that romancing other player characters is off-limits, as not everyone is comfortable with it, and both Rogue and Ranger agree to tone things down and soon move on to romancing NPCs instead. It's at this point that Ranger comes to me to apologize, thinking he'd done something wrong. I, I tell him no, noth nothing's wrong. It's just important sometimes to set boundaries, as not everyone treats the game with the same level of seriousness. Well, I agree with him that Paladin should learn to separate the game from real life. I tell Ranger that I'm erring on the side of caution so that nobody is uncomfortable in game. He says he understands, and I move on, feeling happy that I resolved something and kept my group intact. We keep playing for a while, and yeah, there is a bit of tension between Paladin and Ranger. It doesn't get to the point that it disrupts the game. Then suddenly, everything comes to a head in mid-2021. I'm getting ready to begin the next day's session when I receive a message from Paladin. He won't be able to make it to the game and isn't sure when he'll feel up to playing again. Sensing that something is obviously wrong, as both Cleric and Paladin were the two players in my group who had never missed a session up until that point and look forward to game day every week, I asked him what was going on. Paladin tells me that Rogue has just broken up with him because she's seeing someone else, and she's been seeing someone else, and he is so shocked he couldn't possibly work up the energy to play. I'm not sure what to do, so I just tell him to take the time he needs, and if he feels up to it, he's welcome to join us anyway. With the person who just broke up with him? He thanks me for my offer, but tells me he'll need some time before he can play a game with Rogue in it, as he doesn't want either of them to bring their out-game drama into the game. So, I'm feeling a bit put out by this bombshell, being down a player and being concerned for both Paladin and Rogue. But Bard, Cleric, and Ranger are all still keen to play, so I go ahead and run the weekly session as per normal. It feels rather strange without Paladin there, and I can't help but notice that Rogue and Ranger have started flirting in character again. Paladin isn't there to feel uncomfortable, I figure, so I caution them to be careful and to remember our rule, but basically leave them to it after a while, being blissfully unaware that everything is about to go wrong next session. The next week's session comes around, and Cleric and I have spent a lot of time consoling Paladin, eventually convincing him to come and play with us. We make a promise that both he and Rogue will be civil to each other, and that everyone is just there to play the game. And I recognize now, long after these events, that this was my mistake. By putting these two people together in-game, I was only inviting drama, but at the time, I thought I was just making sure my group ran smoothly and trying to maintain business as usual. Paladin joins the session, and we're right into a dungeon crawl. There's some slight tension between Paladin and Rogue, but for the most part, the session is going smoothly, and everyone is enjoying working on the puzzles and sneaking around the monsters I've carefully planned out. 
Then, for some reason, Ranger starts acting extremely competitive, trying to one-up everything Paladin's character does, and constantly belittling his decisions both in and out of character. He starts bragging about how he's dealt more damage this session than Paladin, or how he and Rogue work much better as a team than Paladin and Cleric do. This obviously gets to Paladin, who is already in a bad frame of mind, and essentially is just there because... Cleric and I forced him to be there. Sensing some drama brewing, I stop the game and tell Ranger that he's being disruptive and warn him that if he doesn't stop needling Paladin, I'll end the session and kick him from the group. Suddenly, Rogue loudly exclaims that she doesn't care about Paladin's feelings and that he's just acting like a baby, and if I was going to kick Ranger, she would be leaving as well. I'm confused at this point, so I reiterate that attacking each other out of character is not tolerated in my game and ask why she would be so offended by me telling Ranger to tone it down. That's when Ranger drops the bombshell on all of us. He is Rogue's new boyfriend, and they've been dating for at least a month! HA! I KNEW IT! I mean, oh, that's so sad. Sorry. This single revelation destroys the entire group in a matter of minutes. Paladin quits in a haze of anger and hatred, humiliated by Rogue and Ranger. Cleric is disgusted by Ranger's behavior and leaves to support his best friend. Obviously, I have no words but to end the session, so I disconnect from voice chat and try to figure out how to process this mess. Rogue comes to me apologizing for Ranger's behavior, but insisting they both did nothing wrong. I ask her what would possibly make her think belittling Paladin in such a way right after they broke up is acceptable. Her response is to tell me why she broke up with Paladin in the first place. Apparently, she is polyamorous and saw nothing wrong with dating Ranger while she was still in a relationship with Paladin. And when Paladin discovered that- wait, discovered? In order to have a poly relationship, Everyone needs to be aware of that. If they're not aware of that, you know what that's called? It's called cheating! Apparently, he wouldn't accept that she was Polly, and so she broke up with him. I didn't quite know what to say to this, so I just said that I accepted that she had her reasons and that was none of my business. My hope was that, given enough time, people would start to cool down and we could move on. It's almost uncanny how swiftly the aftermath unfolds and destroys any faint hope of salvaging anything from this mess. Over the course of the next 48 hours, Paladin ends up having... <laughs> I can't say any of that out loud. Paladin tells Cleric that he resents him for bringing Ranger into the group, and Cleric understandably cuts ties with Paladin due to this, and his quite frankly scary behavior towards Ranger and Rogue after the fact. Ranger feels a little guilty after everything happened, and offers to keep playing with me, but neither me, Cleric, or Bard feel up to it. Rogue insists that she did nothing wrong, and everything was just a ploy on Paladin's part for uh, attention. This all happened about a year ago now. There's a bit more of the story, but this post is long enough as it is, and it mostly seems irrelevant compared to what happened between Paladin, Ranger, and Rogue. I did intend to start a new game with Bard and Cleric and a couple of friends, but shortly after all this happened, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness, and fortunately in the next few months, I took to come to terms and begin treatment, and people began to fall out of touch, and those who are still around have new jobs and commitments. I'm still in contact with Bard, of course, as one of my oldest friends, and I still occasionally talk to Cleric, but Paladin essentially cut off all contact with everyone, and out of concern for my health, I never made any attempt to contact Ranger or Rogue again. After a while, I missed DMing, so I put out a call on Discord and Facebook groups to recruit players, and now I've been playing with a brand new group for the last five months. Sometimes I feel a little sad when I realize I'm playing with strangers instead of actual friends, but with every session I come to, I appreciate these strangers more and more, and on the bright side, the distance created by not knowing anyone personally will ensure the group won't have the same issues. Issues is a very conservative way to describe whatever the crap I just read. Oh my god. Now, let's just talk about the content of the story itself. Don't cheat on people, and don't use polyamory as an excuse to do so. That's bad. Also, also, don't threaten to kill people either. That's bad, and will get you in trouble because it is a punishable offense for a reason, and I think some people really need to learn that. Also, 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 don't chalk the consequences of your actions up to someone else just begging for attention. That's horribly toxic. My god. It just goes to show that life is messy, isn't it? 
even something as innocuous as just playing a board game can get really complicated when you include the human factor. It doesn't matter if you're playing with friends or with randoms. Stuff just happens sometimes. Stuff escalates. Stuff gets to a level that you never could have expected. And sometimes you're just sitting down after a massive calamity thinking, how did I even get here? I can't tell you that that's never going to happen, but here's why I will tell you. I've been through these calamities before, and guess what? I'm still here. I kept going. You can always choose to be better, and you can always choose to get back up. Wow, that last one was... that was a lot. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed, and if you did, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Shadow Over Karakono's actual play D&D podcast. The full series is linked in the cards, and while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment kind of toxic to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, do you have your own horror stories? You can send them directly to us. Email is in the description down below, where you can send your stories to get a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.